Welcome everybody to episode two of our Make Azure AI Real series. In this series, we don't just talk about AI, <laughs> we do AI. Uh, and today we're going to talk about exploring the Azure Open AI service. So I hope you brought your backpack, your snacks, maybe some binoculars. Every time I hear the word exploring, I really think we're going to go camping. But you don't need to bring a map because we actually have a guy here who can, will bring us the map. We have David Smith. David, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks, Corey. Great to see you. How are you doing? Good, good. So we we always like to start off in the series like a bit of a what seems like a random question, but it connects to what we're going to talk about. And this question today is going to be about uh, what is your favorite city? So I want to know in the chat, everyone, what is your favorite city? Uh, it doesn't have to be the city you come from or where you're currently living. Uh, would love to know. But uh, David, what is what is your favorite city? In the, in oh, the that's world? a tough question. Um, off the top of my head, I'd have to say Barcelona. Barcelona. There, it's such an amazing <laughs> city, really good architecture. The food's amazing, a lot of fun. So looking forward to getting back there again sometime. Oh, nice. Never been, never been. But uh, now that I got the your stamp of endorsement, I <laughs> I think I need to make it my make a trip. It's like a two hour flight, so no yeah. excuses from my side. What's your Oscar? Easy answer, easy answer. New York City, uh, oh, yeah. best best city in the world, yeah. uh, in my opinion, at least. So hopefully, maybe there's some New Yorkers in the chat as well. Uh, but yeah, it, it, I mean, I think it offers so much uh, in regards to uh, the to your point, food. Uh, you know, just about any, you, there's about anything always happening, like all the time. Uh, so the buzz, just the feeling of it, it it's just amazing. I, I love New York City. So one day I'll be mm -hmm. back uh, very soon, hopefully. But we're not talking about cities. Well, we will a little bit, but we're talking about making Azure AI real. So what does making Azure AI real mean to you? What, what does making AI real mean to you? What is that like? We, we've called this in the series, but personally, how does that apply to you? I mean, for me, it means getting your hands dirty with the actual models. And that's what this session is going to be all about. We're going to try a whole bunch of prompts uh, with the models that live behind applications like ChatGPT or Bing Chat that you probably used. And we're going to learn a lot about how they really work behind the scenes so you can understand better about how to control these models and what are the best prompts to use to get the most out um, of these language models. Great, great. So... Last time we got, um, no, we didn't get a feedback or anything, but <laughs> we spent 30 minutes. We talked a lot about AI, which was really great, computer vision, but then it took us 30 minutes and then we got to do AI. So I really like what you said, right? Getting your hands dirty. So let's get started. Let's actually start doing AI like the series has said. Uh, let's make Azure AI real with the Azure Open AI service. So let's see, take us away, David. All right. I was actually hoping to present my screen, but unfortunately, I don't have the option to present screen anymore. Oh, now you do. Now yeah. you do. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can see it. The QR code is there and the link. Okay. All right. But I think that is the copy. I'm actually having trouble clicking. When I click present, Corey, I just see the options of slides or video style, but not stop screen. Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm presenting my screen now. I somebody. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Somebody is. We, right. <laughs> secret revealed, everyone. They don't yeah, yeah. trust us here that yeah. much, so we actually have directors in the background. All right. <laughs> pulling, Thank you, silent director in the background for doing yeah, that yeah. for me. <laughs> anyway, this is my one slide for the presentation today. So grab a grab a photograph of it. I follow the QR code or type in that link because that's going to take you to um, the materials uh, for the lab that we're going to go through today. Um, you can follow along as I go along today, um, or you can um, do it at home later on um, at your own pace. But let me go ahead and jump right in and show you where that leads. If you follow that QR code, you go to this GitHub repository. All the materials that I'm using today are free for you to use, adapt, do anything you like. Feel free to fork it um, so you can work with your own copy of it. But the important link is this one down here under README. Uh, click here to get started on this lab. And that's where all the information that I'm going to share with you today is. So we're going to go through this over the next, you know, 45 minutes or so. Now, to do this yourself, either right now or later on, you'll need either an Azure account um, or an OpenAI account. Now, I'm going to do all of this with the um, Azure OpenAI service. You can do this just as well if you have an OpenAI account with the Playground, and I'll show you how to get to that in just a minute. 
We got requests, so some people want to follow along. Um, if if we can go ahead and put that link up back up on the the slide, or maybe if you want to go back to your slide, David. Yeah, let me uh, pop it up. There we go. If you just want to grab a picture of that QR code or grab that link, that's how people can follow along. Yeah. Perfect. And then we'll I will uh, we'll put that in the chat as well, so it can live on yeah. uh, for anyone coming up later. All right. Um, you can have a look what we're going to look at, look at in the sessions today, just in this overview, but we're going to set things up in the Azure OpenAI service. And then we're going to look at how these models work behind the scenes. We're going to understand what a completion is, learn what tokens are, learn kind of what of, uh, give some examples of applications that you can use with these natural language models. Uh, we'll have a look at conversations and prompt engineering. And at the very end, for those of you that are of a more developer bent, we'll talk about how you can use the API to integrate these models uh, into applications. And there'll be lots of links and resources uh, that you've got to look at uh, uh, at the end as well. If we've got time at the end, we might even have a look at Bing chat, uh, but we'll see how we go on time. So I'm gonna scroll to the bottom here to go to the next section of the lab, which is the workshop setup. The first thing I'm gonna do in Azure Opening Air Service is go to the portal. And like I said, I'm going to be doing this in the Azure OpenAI service. And you can do the same if you have an Azure account. You'll need to create a resource. And then you'll be searching for the Azure OpenAI service when that pops up. Azure OpenAI. There it is. And you can create a new resource. Um, I won't go through all the steps here of how to set up the region and the and the um, sets and the um, resource groups and so forth, because I've done this ahead of time. So I'm just going to go back to my portal. And you can see right here, I have a resource I've already created called OpenAI Instruct uh, for this. And then the step, once you have created your resource, is to click this button up the top to go to the Azure OpenAI Studio. And this is where we'll be spending most of our time uh, as we work today. I'm, yeah. I'm really happy you you chose uh, Sweden Central. That's like uh, right in my backyard. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's actually a big secret for these um for these uh, uh large language models. Sweden Central is our newest region, and uh, because it's new, there's not so many people using it, and it's super fast. So I actually love using Sweden Central. Not not anymore. Now everyone's yeah. flocking to Sweden Central. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, as we scroll through these instructions here, um, it does take a few minutes to, to create the deployment, but you can have a look at things like the code of conduct for using the service. This link here is really interesting about data privacy and security, which talks all about how your data is used with Azure OpenAI service. And bottom line, none of the data that you provide in the prompts um, or in the completions is actually used uh, to train in these models by Microsoft. That's one of the big differences we'll get to uh, in a minute. But once you've created the service, the next thing you'll do is create model deployments. Now, again, I've done this ahead of time. So I've already created the two deployments that are described here, GPT-35 Turbo Instruct and GPT-35 Turbo. But the process for creating deployments is pretty simple. You just click that Create New Deployment button and go ahead and create those. But like I said, I did that ahead of time just to save a little bit of time. Corey. Quick question, David. What are, what are the differences between uh, Turbo Instruct and Turbo? Yeah, we'll get to that. But the short answer is Turbo Instruct is a completions model, and uh, GPT-35 Turbo is a chat model. And we're going to actually dive down into the differences between those in just a moment. Nice. And this is my favorite part about doing this live streaming, uh, because people join, and then mm -hmm. they get uh, uh, the questions after. So we do have a favorite city, which is Kona, Hawaii. Never oh, awesome. Been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also somewhere I would love to go one day. Yeah. But a fan of NYC as well. Thank okay. you, Diana. <laughs> All right. Um, if you do want to follow along, but you don't have access to Azure for some reason, or you don't have access to the Azure OpenAI AI service, there is a separate step to apply for access to Azure OpenAI service. You can do this in chat or in, in OpenAI as well. If you've used ChatGPT, you have an OpenAI account, which means you have access to the playground. And I'm just going to move the playground over to this other window here. And this is the uh, environment that you would use in OpenAI to do that. It's pretty much very similar to the interface I'll be using at the moment. I do cover some of the differences in the interface. For example, in OpenAI, there's not a separate chat and completions playground, but it's this mode button 
where you can switch between chat and completions. That's probably the biggest difference to be aware of. And also the buttons are a little different. On Azure, it says generate. Open AI, it says submit. Little things like that. Nice. But there are some differences also to be aware of behind the scenes between OpenAI and Azure OpenAI. And the first one to be aware of is the one I just showed you, is that within Azure OpenAI service, you've got to deploy resources before you begin. There's a good reason for that. Uh, what you're doing in the Azure OpenAI service is essentially creating a version of OpenAI that's private just to you. It's in your, in your own subscription. All the data stays between, within that environment. Whereas when you're using OpenAI, everybody is sharing that same environment. So for especially companies that want to keep all their data private, they like to use Azure OpenAI service to keep everything contained uh, within just their own subscription. Do you want to read more about that? I mentioned already the data privacy and security policies. Uh, if you want to see how OpenAI uses your data, there's a link uh, on the uh, workshop lab there with information on the OpenAI size. I always say, especially when you're working with these generative AI models, mm -hmm. whether it's OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, any other model, do actually read the the data and privacy security. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, it's not like, you know, when you get software and they're like, you know, accept, don't, yeah. don't even scroll down, like these things. Like, I think it's really important, especially like to your point, right? The type of data you're working with, the yeah. use case, the application, like mm -hmm. this, you really should know all that. So this is my one like responsible, like, be responsible and actually uh, read, read that. Read that TLDR, right? Yeah, 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 yeah right? Yeah. Maybe, or get ChatGPT to like summarize it. I don't know, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's, it's really mm. important, especially when you're using any of these type of models. Exactly. All right. Um, one other thing to be aware of about a difference between Azure OpenAI service and OpenAI is that the Open AI, Azure OpenAI service provides some additional capabilities that are, again, mainly of interest to enterprises that are integrating these models. Uh, in particular, it has an abuse monitoring feature and a content filtering feature that is enabled by default. Uh, you do have control over how it works, uh, but I mentioned it here because it's going to come up when we have a look at the API a little bit later on, because that is one of the differences between the two APIs. If you are a developer, the APIs are very, very similar. Um, Azure OpenAI service handles authentication a little bit different way, and there's some more information that comes back from the service. But if you've used one, you can adapt to the other super easily. But that's kind of more of an in-depth developer topic. So that's kind of the intro. Let's actually get into the fun stuff and start playing around with these models. Now, this goes back to the question you asked me earlier on, Corey. What is the difference between those two models? Um, most people will be familiar with GPT-35 Turbo, even if not by that name. But if you're using ChatGPT, that's most likely the model that behind the scenes is responding, responding to your questions and generating that conversation. So we'll be looking at that quite a bit. Um, we'll also be looking at a, at a variant of that model, which has actually only just been released in the last couple of months. It's called GPT-35 Turbo Instruct. It's a very, very similar kind of model. It's based on the same data. It was trained in much the same way. But whereas the Turbo model is focused around chats, conversations, say something, respond something in a complete sentence, and keep on turning that over. The Turbo Instruct model is something called a completions model, which has a much simpler job, which is just to take a bit of text, say, for example, once upon a time, and then provide an appropriate completion to that text. Like, for example, in this case, there was a princess who lived in a council with a space before it, so that when you put those two things together, the prompt and the completion, it makes a complete piece of text. You know, it's very rare that something, like especially in this space, something named something is actually what it does. But yep. in this case, completions is... Yep. And, and completions it. is the fundamental job of these yeah. large language models behind the scenes. In fact, that's everything that is happening behind the scenes is a completion. So we're going to spend a lot of time on completions because that's what you really need to understand to understand how these models work. Now, I haven't said much about what it means to be an appropriate completion or a good completion. We'll talk more about that a bit later. But for now, just think of it as fancy autocomplete. It just generates some text that makes sense following the prompt that you gave. So we're going to see lots of examples of that. Now, one thing you should be aware of when using any large language model, including the models that we'll be using today, is that they were trained at a point in time. So they're trained on lots of data, you know, from the internet, from books, all sorts of places, examples of natural language. But in this case, the models were cut off in September 2021. So what that means is it's not going to generate a completion 
that would rely on information that was created after September 21. So it's not going to complete with news information, for example, because it's never seen any data like that. So that's something to be aware of. We'll see some consequences of that a little bit later on. Another thing to remember is something called the prompt window limit. There is a maximum size of information of the, of the prompt you can give to the model. And likely there's a maximum size of the response that the model can give you back. And in fact, you have to combine those two things together. And there is a maximum limit for the combined prompt and response. Uh, for the models we're using today, that limit is something called 4,096 tokens. We're going to talk about tokens in detail in a little while. But now just understand that's about 3,000 English words of the prompt and the response combined is the maximum limit of what you can get. And we have a parameter we control to actually reduce that number down, as we'll see in a minute as well. All right. Nice. So I was just going to ask you, like, ahead, how, yeah. how, how do we control? Like, we maybe, you know, obviously we have control over yeah. what we give the model, but how do we say, hey, model, like, I only want so much back. Yeah, uh, there, there is a max tokens parameter, which we're going to use, which is really useful when we want to actually stop the model from just going on and on and on, as we'll see in a bit. Yeah. Um, but we're going to play with that parameter quite a bit. Nice. So just before we begin, I'm going to go back to um, my Azure OpenAI Studio homepage and just go back to my deployments. And I can see I've already got GPT-35 Turbo Instruct and GPT-35 Turbo. Uh, they're all ready for me to go to use. So let's go ahead and jump in and do some completions. So as I mentioned, we're going to start using that GPT-35 Turbo uh, instruct model. And remember, a completion is just some likely text to follow a little bit of text that you provide, a fancy autocomplete. So let's actually try this out. All right. So we're going to go to something called the completions playground. When you're at your Azure Studio, Azure OpenAI Studio homepage, just click on completions here in the left hand tab. Okay. If you are using the OpenAI playground, you just make just have to make sure the mode is set to complete here, but I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use this one right here. The other thing to check is that the deployment that you're using, the actual underlying model, is that Turbo Instruct model. So that's the completions model that I mentioned earlier on. So Corey, let's try a few things. I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger just for the folks at home. Um, let's, let's do that big just so you can see everything. Maybe I'm just going to close that as well. Maybe I'll make it one more bigger. There we go. All right. Here's my prompt, Corey. I climbed and at the apple tree and picked Anne. What do we think it's going to respond with? What's a fancy order complete for that? Oof. I hope an apple. I hope an apple tree. Now let's go ahead and click <laughs> generate and see what this model does. I climbed the apple tree and picked Anne. And what the model generated comes up in green there. And you can see it did respond apple. But then it decided to give me a couple of other paragraphs as well. The crisp. You know, that was going to be my next guest. That was going to be the crisp autumn air surrounding yeah. me as I climb. That was going to be my next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can kind of see where that might have come from. It's probably read in its training data. You know, lots of stories about people talking about picking trees from an apple. And this is maybe the kind of language that's most prevalent in the data set. So um, I can click the regenerate button and try that again. And we might get something different. It's still an apple. It looks like it's a little bit of a different story that follows on uh, from that there again. So fancy autocomplete, but the natural, the first word at least is very natural what you'd expect. I climbed the apple tree and picked an apple. All right. Now I'm just going to clear everything so I can get ready for my next one. Just press Control A and delete. That's the easiest way to clear the completions window, or you can just press the refresh button on your browser too. All right. Let's try a few other things. Uh, let's try something sort of factual. Let's ask it a factual question. What is the capital of Australia? Before you click on that, I, yeah, yeah. I want to know if anybody in the audience knows this. <laughs> yeah. if, if people haven't guessed from my accent, which is a bit sort of muted these days, I am from Australia originally. So okay. I, 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 the capital I, or not the capital? Yeah, uh, well, let's, <laughs> let's find out. So let's see. Uh, well, I know Chat GPT knows the answer or the GPT yes. model. Let's see if it gets let's it see. right here. The capital of Australia is Canberra. Okay. So it actually gave not just a likely response, but the correct response to this particular okay. problem. That's because there's so much data in its training data that relates the capital of Australia to Canberra, and it doesn't get the answer wrong and say anything like Sydney there. All right, let's try something classic, else. Classic mistake, Sydney. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's try another one. This one says, a recipe for banana bread and an itemized shopping list of the ingredients. So this is a little bit more of a complex prompt. Let's see what it comes back. Banana bread recipe, ingredients, all-purpose flour, baking soda, salt, butter, sugar, eggs, vanilla extract, 
three ripe mashed bananas and chopped nuts optional. And then it says instructions, preheat your oven to 350. Oh, it's stopped. Um, <laughs> this is this is where that max length comes in. So we've got max length tokens here is 100. It's about 70 words. We can see about 70 words there in the combined prompt and response. So one thing you should do is just so you've got enough room to generate interesting responses, bump that max length up to 1,000. Yeah. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete all that. Let me just actually do it this way. Control A, Control D. Let me paste it back in. And we should get much fuller banana bread recipe back from the model this time. There we go. We've got some instructions now. Preheat your oven, blah, blah, blah. I have never tried this banana bread recipe. Um, I've run this prompt quite a few times. It comes something very much like this every time. I suspect it's pretty good. Um, but there's no guarantee this is a good recipe. The model has no capability of actually putting these ingredients together and sticking them in an oven and seeing what comes out. Um, so be careful, um, but it might at least be a good guide for you um, if you wanted to figure out you know, how to make banana bread. Definitely be careful. Also, I just yeah. imagine that somebody's reading this and just turn their oven on and stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, well, that yeah. was it. But uh, I do feel like a theme coming on and make Azure yeah. AI real where... You know, if we do have these opportunities like making banana bread, we should yeah. certainly <laughs> make banana bread based on these recipes. Yeah. So yeah. remember, uh, it's, it's just fancy autocomplete. It's not, yeah. a, not a chef. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So but we right. will try that recipe I'll, I'll, at the end of this series. So yeah, we'll if anybody the... wants to try that recipe, let us know how it goes. I'd be really interested to see if it sure. makes good banana bread. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's the next uh, prompt. What were the top 10 movies of 2001? Respond in the form of a table listing the movie name, the box office earnings, and the studio. Let's generate from this one. What do we get? Movie name, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, 974.8 million by Warner Brothers. Lots of other movies there from 2001. This looks pretty good. Uh, one thing to be aware of, I asked it to respond in the form of a table. And when... Uh, these GPT models get a prompt like that. They tend to respond with what's called a markdown table. Any developers in the audience will recognize that. If you put that into a markdown renderer, it'll come out as a nicely formatted table with three columns. And in fact, that's what chat GPT does for you. If you type that prompt into chat GPT, when it renders that response, it actually renders it as a nice looking table. But here we just see the raw text that comes directly back from it. Okay, so that's that one's pretty good. One more example. What if we ask it to generate not English, but code? Write a Python function to calculate the nth prime number. What does it come back with? Here, indeed, is code that looks like Python code. And in fact, as I look at this, um, this looks like the sieve of Aristosthenes. I think I pronounced that right, which is a standard computer science 101 problem. Um, it's probably represented many times on the internet. And so this is very likely to be a good piece of code uh, for generating the nth prime number. How's that look to you, Corey? I mean, I'm not going to run it to, to test it, but it looks okay to me. It looks looks yeah. good. I, I trust it this time. Yeah, I'm an R programmer <laughs> myself, not a Python programmer, but it looks good to me. All right. Yeah. Better than the banana recipe. Better All than right. the banana recipe. Okay, so the, but the learning here is it can generate code as well as text, and that's because its training data also includes a lot of code. So if you ask it to generate code in a certain programming language, it will be able to do that, most likely. All right. Now, in the... Previous examples, we've asked it to sort of do things like factual, you know, give us some factual information or some information that might be available on it in its training data. But let's try something a little bit different. Let's let's make it creative. Let's ask it to write a limerick about the Python language. All right. Can, I don't we, know define, how many... can we define limerick for the people in the audience who? Oh, if anybody doesn't know limerick, standard, you know, humorous poetry form, five lines, first, second, and fifth. Lines should rhyme. Third and fourth lines also rhyme in a different way. And it's usually something pretty funny. And here's what it came up with. There once was a language called Python. Its syntax was syntax was smooth as a siren, with indentation so clean, coding was a dream, and debugging was never a frightened. <laughs> right. right. So the, the language is great there. The rhyming is good. I quite like rhyming Python with siren. I wouldn't think to do that, but it works. Um, but the point here is that this limerick, I'm guessing, probably doesn't exist on the internet. It has generated this out of whole cloth by understanding some information about what Python is and a programming language and its attributes and seeing enough examples of the format of a limerick, both in its structure and its rhyming style, 
to be able to generate something that looks like a limerick. That's pretty amazing. There's a button I haven't introduced yet called Regenerate. And what it does is it takes the bit in white, your prompt, replaces, takes out the bit in green and does a, another generation. So we can actually put Regenerate and we see we get a different limerick this time. And once was a language called Python with syntax that was quite light and fun. It's easy to learn and makes code so clean for programmers, it's second to none. All right, not too bad. I'm not happy about learn and clean rhyming together, but it is a different limerick. limerick. And you can regenerate as many times as you like um, to get different answers. And in fact... Maybe, maybe yeah, one on. question here, because yeah. maybe some people are you know familiar with the chat GPT-like experience yeah. where uh, you know maybe the regenerate is just trying to improve. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. the, the the completion or the response, yeah. or you know, you can provide feedback uh, mm -hmm. or whatnot. Is this kind of doing the same thing where the model kind of it feel? Let's say it uh, understands like this was just what this last limerick wasn't sufficient, and it tries to make some improvements, or is it really just going back and doing the same thing but having to get another? Result? No, it is. Well, in this case, we're not using ChatGPT. We're using the underlying model here. So this is one example of generating a completion from a prompt. But the important thing to learn here is that these models are random. They don't always generate the same response for the same prompt because it's controlled by this parameter called temperature. Now that can be a value between zero and one. One is the highest number you can put into the Azure OpenAI service. If you, you can technically go higher than one, but you'll just start getting gibberish, random characters yeah. at that point. <laughs> but at temperature of one, you usually get something that looks like English or whatever you know, response you've asked for, but there'll be randomness in it. So every time I click regenerate, I will get a different limit. Now the last line and its libraries were always a winning. On con conversely, if I set the temperature to zero and type regenerate, oops, I'm gonna have to, let me just go ahead and do generate first. There we go. Temperature is set to zero and we have one limerick that was generated with temperature zero. It's not a bad one. But what happens if I click regenerate now? There we go. So it's being a little bit slow. I get the same one. And every time I click regenerate, I'm going to get the same response. So as a programmer, you can set this temperature parameter down to zero. Um, you're almost guaranteed, not completely, but almost guaranteed to get the same response every time. But it won't be quite as creative. You know, it's just that the thing you get back is the basically the most probable sequence of characters that the model might generate from that prompt. And that might not, not be what you want. You might want variability. You might want more creativity. So that's why we give the programmers control over that temperature parameter. Let's try another example. What is a unique and long name for a cat? OK, I've got a temperature of zero right now. Let me go ahead and generate that. Maximilian Bartholomew Whiskerbottom III. OK, that is definitely a unique and long name for a cat. Very long, yes. Yeah. If I regenerate that, mm -hmm. again, my temperature is zero, so I'm going to get the same response. Let's try an intermediate value for temperature, 0 0.7. Let me try regenerating that one. OK, that's the same one so far, Whiskerworth, Whiskerworth. Okay, I might still be using the old. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. Well, it changed the middle name that last one. So yeah, it, I did. Okay, I missed it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So like the point seven, you can kind of see when it, when it comes to long names for cats. It's, it's yeah. You know. But yeah, so that's just Serafina. Here we go. Uh, Maximilian. All right, all sorts of different Belladonna middle names. So we're getting different names now with this intermediate temperature value. I I tend to like using zero point seven. You know, I think it's a nice balance between sort of the sure. repeti repetition and the creativity. But an appropriate temperature value depends on the actual application that you're using. Sometimes you want it to be deterministic. Sometimes you want more creativity. All right, I'm just going to set the temperature back to one for the rest of the examples here. All right, let's have a look at some prompts that don't work so well. I'm calling these less useful prompts. Let's have a This is a classic example. Oops, right, let me delete all that. There we go. When did Queen Elizabeth II die? Generate. Queen Elizabeth II is still alive as of 2021. She was born on April 21, 1926, and is currently 95 years old. So this is implying that Queen Elizabeth, who died in late 2021, I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, 2022. Yeah, anyway, it was after, the point being, it was after the training data cutoff of September 21. So it has no information 
in its training data that Queen Elizabeth ever died. And so the most likely completion given in its training data to this prompt is Queen Elizabeth II is still alive. So be aware of that. Now, one thing you might recognize, if you typed that same prompt into applications like ChatGPT or Bing Chat, it will give you the right answer about Queen Elizabeth being dead. And that's because they're not just using this model behind the scenes. They're also providing the model with some additional data that comes from the web, new, new information sources. Um, and that's a procedure called grounding, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the core model at the middle has no idea that Queen Elizabeth II ever died. All right, let's try another example. Uh, control A, Control D. There we go. What is the square root of 98765 generates? Now, the true answer to this is 314.269. However, the model has given me an answer, but it's telling me that it's 314.041. That is incorrect. Not too far away, though. <laughs> but it's still incorrect. What if I'm building the space shuttle or something? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to be reliable. I mean, Queen right. Elizabeth being alive or dead, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. far away. Yeah, it's a binary. but yeah. Now, the reason why <laughs> it's, it's kind of close is because, remember, it's, the response is based on its training data. And it's probably seen problems kind of similar to this one, but not exactly that. So I can get kind of maybe the first few digits of it right. And certainly if you ask it things like, you know, what is one plus one, it'll tell you it's two. Because there's lots of instances in the training data of people writing down one plus one equals two. But not many people have probably written down what is the square root of 98765 with the answer. So there's nothing in its training data really to guide it. It's surprising it even gets close to me. Uh, sure. But that is definitely a wrong answer. These models can't do math. It's just fancy autocomplete. Keep that in mind. All right. On the other hand, if we were to do the prompt, oops, let me try this again. There you go. Write Python code to calculate the square root of 98765 generate. Um, it'll probably, oh, well, this is definitely the right answer. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, interestingly, import math and print math square root. That's all correct. Uh, that will give you the right answer in Python. Um, this comment here, output, that's not right. Um, so that's kind of funny because it's never seen a Python program to do exactly that thing. So it's never seen the output. So it's really just trying to, what is the most likely thing? Happens to get it wrong based on its training data. Interesting. I've never seen that particular output before. Remember, these models are not deterministic. You can be surprised. Um, and if you set that to, to the temperature to zero, I mean, that will just oh. respond back to... With It'll respond back with the most likely answer. Yeah. But this is a... Oops, let me try this again. Uh, delete. Come on, keyboard. There we go. So temperature is zero now. Generate. This is a really good point, Corey. Um, the temperature is zero, so it's not going to give me any variation in response. Yeah, fair that enough. That yeah. doesn't guarantee it's correct. Mm -hmm. Because again, even with temperature zero, the most likely response, given its training data, the code is correct as it happens. But that, that comment right there is still wrong. So good lesson here. Temperature of zero does not guarantee correctness. It just reduces variability. OK. All right. Let's have a look at another. So this is a puzzle. All right. So puzzle is, Stephen is my uncle. Stephen has two children, Sam and Lindsay. Sam's sole aunt is called Julie. What is my mother's name? Now, can you solve that one, Corey? Oh, man. Is it is it Julie? It is, yeah, because like Stephen is my uncle, his children are my cousins. If they only have one aunt, it must be my mother. So it's Julie. All right. But if we try to get this model, GPT 3.5 Turbo Instructs, to answer that, um, it can't figure it out. Uh, GPT 3.5, you know, has some limited reasoning capabilities, but it can't solve logic puzzles, even if this relatively simple complexity. Now, there were, new, there were newer models out there. For example, you probably heard of GPT-4. Yes, uh, GPT-4 can yeah. actually get the right answer to this puzzle. Uh, but these um, uh, s s relatively smaller models, like GPT-3.5, um, can't figure out uh, this kind of reasoning problem. All right. All right. Um, one more thing. Let's have a look at the non-deterministic nature again. We've already seen this when we had a look at playing around with temperature. I'm going to make sure the temperature here is one. If you tick name a country and click generate, 
What do we get? Canada this time. Canada, Canada, Japan, France, Canada, Canada. So again, this is another example of how these models don't always generate the same uh, response. Okay, we covered that one already. Let's have a look at this one. Models have no memory. I'm going to put into GPT-535 Turbo Instruct. Hello, my name is David. Generate. Comes back with, oh. Oh, um, okay. Well, that's an unusual response. I was expecting that one. It's just continuing that. Actually, let me change the prompt a little bit. Is this accurate to you, David? That was that. That was your bio. Right. <laughs> right. That, was, that was just a good point. Uh, I, I, hey, let me try it again. Generate. There are a few spots of response to this interruption, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm getting some interesting response. Nice to meet you. Anyway, it's just, you know, fancy autocomplete. But the point I wanted to make here is if I then put in something to follow along to this, for example, you can give me a nickname if you like. All right. Some people call me Lil or Lil D for short, but you can call me whatever you feel comfortable with. Again, I'm surprised by this. So it usually generates an actual nickname. Let me try it again. Regenerate. I just want to confirm, uh, it was this accurate. Can we also call you Lil D? You can't, but that's not all the point. Like some people call me Al or Alexa. Um, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is that the model doesn't remember that I told it before that my name is David uh, because these models have no memory. Now, of course, that's not the way chat GPT works. You can say, hello, my name is David. And then it will say, hi, David. And you can say, give me a nickname. It'll say, yeah, have a nickname of Dave, for example. But these models have no memory. Every time you put a new prompt in, it has no memory of the previous prompts that have been provided. And it doesn't learn from the prompts at all. The model is fixed in time. It is a black box that never changes. So that's a lesson there. All right, another example about these models. I'm just gonna go ahead and refresh this page. There we go. Next prompt I'm gonna give it is, I'm gonna, because I refreshed, it's reset that max length. So let me put that back. What are the top five mister, movies listed at rottentomatoes.com slash browse slash movies in theaters, which as you might guess, is a list of the top five movies currently in theaters. If I generate that, what do we see? It's generated a list of movies, but they're all from 2019. So here's the thing. The model cannot actually go to that website. I can't look at the data that's currently on that website. So currently the top five movies are beyond Utopia and other things like that. So that's not the correct answer that it's given here. What it's giving me is a completion based on, you know, probably the training data. So for some reason, the training data for this page probably came from 2019. It recognizes the URL. There's some data in its training data that comes from that URL, but it's way out of date. So the point to remember is not just that these models are, are frozen in time, but they can't perform actions like visiting a website to inform their information. Now, again, ChatGPT can do that now. It has a feature called um, Search in Bing, I think it's called, where it will actually go out to that website and grab that data and then use that data to inform its response. But that's not its default behavior. Uh, Bing Chat does do that by default. If you put that question into Bing Chat, you'll get the right answer. OK. All right, lastly. And this is a really important lesson, is that completions are not facts. I'm going to ask it to write a two-paragraph paragraph obituary for Harold Bloomsbury, inventor of the fidget spinner, and invent append two references. Generate. What do we come back? <coughs> RIP Harold, by the way. Yeah. Harold Bloomsbury, the inventor of the beloved fidget spinner, passed away at the age of 78 on Monday. He was a visionary. In 1993, he came up with the idea for the fidget spinner and a couple of references. Looks like we got the obituary in New York Times and a link to CNN. Does that look right to you, Corey? I don't know. I don't know too much about Old Herald, mm -hmm. uh, but tell well, me. Here's the thing. I made that up. There is no person called Harold Bloomsbury. He definitely didn't invent this, the fidget spinner. I'm not sure whether the inventor for that is, is credited. And so because the model had no grounding in its training data, Harold Bloomsbury is a name that doesn't exist anywhere, as far as I can tell. It just does the fancy autocomplete. And it says, well, he's asked for it, a victory of Harold Bloomsbury. And from the context of the prompt, it seems like he was inventor of the fidget spinner. So I'm going to go ahead and essentially make shut up stuff yeah. up. Sorry, I almost saw that. Make stuff yeah. up. This is a family show, David. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I am Australian. All right. Um, so anyway, so this is just invented out of whole cloth. None of this is true. And even these references, 
Like, if I try and go to this website here, it doesn't exist. Oh. Like, it's just made up something that looks like a valid website, um, but much. doesn't actually exist. So this is just a, a completely made up bunch of information. And even if I were to set the temperature to zero, I would still get an obituary and it would still be just as wrong. Um, so completions are not facts. Remember that is just fancy autocomplete. And this applies just as well if you ask something like ChatGPT a question that it shouldn't know the answer to. If you imply in your question that you know the answer, it'll make stuff up for you. <laughs> All right. Let's so go in. In the here in the make a Azure a, AI real, we know we, we love questions when people look like they want to start working with things. And this is a classic question every time we uh show the Azure Open AI service. So I'm gonna give this to you because I've answered this so many times in my life. But uh, <laughs> when will the service be open for everyone, David? Uh the service is currently open for everyone, it is in general availability. Uh, there is just one extra step that you need to go through to give your Azure subscription access to Azure Open AI service. Uh, that extra steps exists just to make sure that Microsoft is adhering to our responsible AI principles. So we just want to ask some questions about how you plan to use the service first. Uh, but it is generally available to everybody. Beautiful. Couldn't say it better myself. All right. OK. Um, we've talked about tokens a few times. Haven't really gone into detail about what they are. So let's do that now real quickly. First of all, notice at the bottom of the Azure OpenAI service uh, completions playground, there's something that says tokens 367. So this is telling me that all the text on this page, both the prompt and the output together, counts as 367 tokens. But what is a token? Let's find out. Um, let's have a look at a couple of other examples. If I put Apple in here, all right, and in a moment it will say Apple is one token. All right, let's try hamburger. Hamburger in there, uh, Apple hamburger. Something's gone weird with the control V in this thing right now. Let me do that. Control V. There we go. Hamburger is says it's two tokens. That's interesting. Sometimes it's three. There we go. Hamburger. And let's try Skarsgård, one of my favorite actors. Let's use. Oh, his pulling turn. the Swedish strings really. I mean, you. Oh, I, 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 the I, I central, we had you on the other goal. Yes, uh, yeah, this is it, uh, really good. no. Your this audience. Was not Swedish pandering. This was actually <laughs> literally one of my favorite actors. Skarsgård is all the way up to five tokens. All right. So this is what you learn, is that a token might be a whole word or it might be part of a word. And what we do is we essentially break down all possible words into little chunks. Very common words like Apple get their own chunk. Um, more complex words like hamburger might be broken down into multiple chunks. And proper names might be broken down into the individual letters or very small chunks. And this is how, with a limited number of chunks or tokens, about 32,000 in the case of GPT-35, we can represent not just the entire English language, but all other languages as well, and even words that haven't been invented yet, simply by combining tokens together. And we can see that in a little bit more detail if we try out this OpenAI tokenizer. This is a nice little tool that OpenAI provides. We can drop in some text, and then it colorizes it so you can see all the different tokens in this word. Scarguard is a combination of SK as a token, ARS as a token, G, just the letter as a token, the A with, what do you call that uh, accent? Oh, it's pronounced like O. Okay, O, um, as Gord. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. So I, I was going to mention that because yeah. uh, I've heard, and this kind of even points to it, but yeah. uh, non-English words uh, yeah. tend to take up more tokens than English no, words. Yeah. Oh, no, non-English words take up fewer tokens than in okay. other languages. Yeah. And that's why it's actually more expensive to run these models in Chinese or in Swedish because the efficiency of the token compression isn't as good as it is right, in English. Yeah. And that's simply because on the overall internet, there is much more English than any other language. And so the token sort of tokenization system optimized towards English because that was the most frequent thing that it needed to compress, essentially. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's a little bit about tokens. You don't normally think about need to think about tokens. Um, except to understand how completions are actually generated behind the scenes, because they're not generated as a complete bunch of text. They're not even generated word by word. They're generated token by token. And we can actually see that process in action. Um, I'm not going to go to this in all detail, but there's a great blog post linked right here by uh, one of my colleagues, Beatrice Stoners, 
um, which really explains this, this process in detail if you're interested in it. But we can just see it as a demo right here. I'm going to go back to that prompt we had before. Here is a unique and long name for a cat. I'm going to give it a, even a, a letter to start. Let's start with the letter J. When you try this, choose any letter you like. It doesn't matter, but it just helps it um, get started here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the max length to one. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to click generate. What do we get back? We get one token. We get the token AZ. If I click generate again, we get another token, Bell. So it keeps on adding on new tokens to the response, putting them back into the entire prompt. Because what's happening now is it's taking both the, the, the black and white and the green together as the prompt. Every time I click generate, adds a new token and recycles the prompt each time. And that's why that prompt limit that we mentioned way back at the beginning, that's why it covers both the input prompt and the output, because all of them together ultimately have to be combined to generate that very last token. And this is probably going to be, keep on, I'm going to keep on tick, keep on clicking. Until uh, it's point. just, I mean, this is a perfect for the cat. It just seems like it's okay. just naming anything. And then look, we have the third again. Yeah, it really loves it. It loves that. It loves that particular one. But look what happened. At the very end, I got an error. No text was genera generated by the model. There is one special token that the model might generate, and that's called the stop token. And that is the model saying, I don't have anything more to add to this completion. This completion is done. And that's what happened in this particular case. There is another option you have. We can, you can provide stop sequences here if you want the model to perhaps stop when it says, you know, hash, 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 or something like that. As a developer, you have some control of making it stop manually when it detects certain text. But the stop token is always there and might be generated by the model. All right. Um, we have talked about token limits in the models we're using. Both the prompt and the response has to fit into 4,096 tokens or about 3,000 words. There are other models out there that have bigger prompt limits, like GPT-4, uh, which can go up to 32,000 and a bit tokens. Now, this might be useful if you need to provide a very long prompt. Or as we'll see when we get to prompt engineering, if you want to provide more information in the prompt that the model can use as grounding for its actual response. And so that's why some people go to these models with these bigger prompts for that reason. All right, let's go to the next section using generative AI. Um, let's have a look at some of the applications you can do with generative AI and these models. Again, we're still using the completions model just to keep things simple. Uh, we're going to change the temperature to 0 0.7 and the max tokens we're going to set back to 1,000. All right, and let's see some of the things these models can actually do that are useful. For example, translation. I'm going to enter in this prompt. Translate the following into French and Spanish. One, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your in-store experience today? Two, how likely are you to recommend our product to others? Then response French. Sur une échelle de 1 à 10, à quel point êtes-vous satisfait de votre expérience au magasin aujourd'hui? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's good, good French. Um, not so good at Spanish, but that looks like decent Spanish to me as well. Do you speak Spanish, Corey? No, but I thought as a Barcelona, uh, you know, it's your favorite city that you would have had some Spanish for us. So. <laughs> no, I, I can order beers in Spanish. That's about uh, it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but anyway, I, just as an example, I want to remind folks, that these models are trained not just on English data. Um, they actually learn from the structure of other of one language to be able to create text in the other, and they can, there's French data to generate French output. So anyway, you can use these models as translations. And it actually turns out they're pretty good. Um, this, in fact, was the original motivation for building the transformer former models that actually sit behind these foundation models that we're using. Um, so translation is something you can do. Uh, in general, if you give it a prompt in French, it'll generate a response in French, and same for other languages as well. Or you can explicitly ask it to do translations. Let's have a look at another example, information extraction. So the prompt I'm giving it is to say, extract the person name, company name, location, and phone number from the text below. And the text below is, hello, my name is Robert Smith. I'm calling from Contoso Insurance, Delaware. My colleague mentioned you're interested in learning about our comprehensive benefits policy. Could you give me a call back at that number when you get a chance so we can go over the benefits? And the green is the response. And you can see it's done exactly what I've asked it to do. It's extracted the person name in that text, Robert Smith, the company name, Contoso Insurance, the location, Delaware, and the phone number. And you can see all those are correct. Now, this is a really useful application of these GPT models. Because imagine you might have a wealth of text data, you know, 
customer support chat logs, um, voicemail transcriptions, uh, product reviews, comments, anything. And now you can apply a prompt like this across all of those bits of text one by one and extract out the explicit pieces of information you want to get from those random pieces of text. The text doesn't have to be in any particular format. doesn't have to be structured in the same way. doesn't have to use keywords. It'll figure it out. And this is a really, really powerful technique for extracting structured information, in this case, name, company name, location, and phone number, from really messy unstructured text data. All right. So I'm a data scientist, so I love that example. And I've just been you know, working through my entire career with messy text data. Oh. I want to do things with ORC or GREP or you know, all sorts of things. If I had this 10 years ago, would have revolutionized my life. <laughs> all right, here's another example. There are many fruits that have been found the recently discovered planet Gucrux. There are neo schizzles, blah, blah, blah. Please make a table summarizing the fruits. And in this case, I actually prompted it with three examples. And then it responded back with the three other examples extracted from the text I provided. And there's two lessons to learn here. First of all, I chose this example because these are not real words, low heckles. Like, it's the, the model can adapt even in situations where there's text data it's never seen before. That's one thing to learn. And the second thing to learn is this idea called um, one-shot learning. I provided a few examples. It was able to use that format I provided and the process to generate the rest. So this is a useful prompt engineering technique to help guide the model to do the thing that you want. You heard that before, the one-shot examples, Corey? Yeah, it's. I think it's super effective. Um, uh, it, like you said, it's, I mean, to your point, back in data science world, right, when you had to have more than one shot training or learning to actually get yeah. something productive out of the model. So yeah. it's super impressive to see that uh, okay. in, in this one example. Yeah. I just wanted to show you a variation on that one. Rather than asking to provide a table, I said, this time, make a JSON array. And indeed, in this case, it has created for me a JSON array with the attributes name, color, and taste again, extracted from that text. So you can actually tell the model how to format the responses that you want to get out uh, from the data extraction process. Very nice. So we're coming up on the hour mark. Uh, so yeah. maybe you have one more example. You one can, more uh, example? Yeah. Very good. OK. Um, all right, this is a cool one. Clear. Let me just generate that. Oops. There we go. Um, classify the following news headline. This is a classification example. So I'm telling it to generate it into one of five categories, giving it a news headline. As This is a one-shot example. So this is showing the model how it's supposed to do its thing. And then the second example, I haven't provided the category. So I click Generate, and it does indeed identify that this headline, major retailer announces plans to close 100 stores, is indeed of the category of business. So you can use these models to categorize information into certain buckets. Do sentiment analysis, like is this, a, is this a positive response from a customer or a negative response? All sorts of interesting applications you can use to apply uh, to your data there. All right. So um, since we're coming up on time, I'll let the folks know you're welcome to continue with all these examples um, that exist here in the GitHub repository. It all takes you through step by step. Maybe we, we can get, get the link uh, one more time up if you, yeah, if let you me have pop it up on the screen for everybody that might have missed it there. there for is. the people who fast forward to the end of the video. <laughs> all right, okay, so just follow that QR code. I'll follow that link. Yes. And all the materials are right there. And there's one quick example I want to show, though, um, from uh, this example on the chat playground. Um, let's, let's pick one here. Okay, let's go to just quickly the chat playground. So all through all through this so far, we've been using the completions playground, but the chat playground is slightly different because you use a different API called the chat API, which actually remembers the prior parts of information. So I just need to make my screen a little bit smaller so we can um, get to the chat window. There we are. OK. Uh, I'm going to close that one just to make things a little bit bigger. Put in the prompt, how many neutrons are in a hydrogen nucleus? Oh. One thing I forgot to do in setup is let me go back here. It's just got to make sure it's using, it's giving me an error because it's, I've told it to use the instruct model, which is a completions model, but I need to use a chat model here. So let me go ahead and refresh. 
There we go. Oh, it's still got the arrow there, but let's put that there. Let's go to the turbo model. How many neutrons are in a hydrogen nucleus? A hydrogen nucleus consists of one proton and zero neutrons. Well, what if I then follow up with what about the isotopes? Now, it recognizes when I'm talking about isotopes, it's for the hydrogen atom, and it gives me information about uh, tritium and deuterium. Now, I said earlier on that these models never learn. They um, don't have information about your previous prompt. So how is this working in this case? And we can do that if I click this Show Raw JSON button. And as you can see behind the scenes, this is everything that's passed into the model. This is the chat API that I mentioned briefly. And you can see that not only does it get my prompt, it also gets the complete history of the conversation. So it's using that history to inform its response to the question, what about the isotopes? And that's what's happening behind the scenes in applications like ChatGPT and Bing Chat. It is using the history of the chat to inform its responses. Now, there's a limit to how much history it can provide because there is a limit to that prompt window, as I mentioned. And in this interface, you can control the number of past messages that are provided to the, the underlying model so that you don't exceed that prompt limit. All right, I think that's a good place to, to end things so we can get to questions at all. Um, I also want to mention that if you want to know more about prompt engineering, there is a really great introduction to prompt engineering on Learn, on Microsoft Learn. I've summarized the techniques that we've seen in your examples already, like using few shot learning and non-chat scenarios like data extraction and so forth. You can read through this here. And in fact, all I did was I used ChatGPT um, to summarize this page. Nice. If, you want to, if you want to go to chat GPT, the full page, there's lots of information about prompt engineering uh, right there. Um, lastly, Ooh. we didn't get to using the API, but if you are programmers, follow around that, and you can actually see how to run these completions as a curl program or as Python code, so you can integrate it into your app applications. And there are lots of additional resources and links that you can follow up right there on the last page. But uh, that is all we had. Very Ooh. nice. Well, thank you, David, for giving us this map around uh, you know, Azure OpenAI, but also just the, how these models respond, the temperatures, the parameters. Like, I think when people see all the knobs and you know turns you can do, sometimes people don't know. It. It's always great to experiment, but it's great to also have a guide to tell us a little bit more about what uh, what those all mean. So, thank you for joining us on the Make Azure AI Real, and thank you all in the audience. You could have been anywhere on the internet right now, but you spent a basically an hour with us. So that I feel that truly appreciate it, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.